Welcome back to the Fans of Home Team podcast. I'm Kelsey. And I'm Miranda. This podcast that talks about the fun, the drama, and the effects that sports teams and athletes bring to the world, whether good or bad. This is a podcast for people who care about sports in a deeper way than who won or who lost. It's for the people who love the feel-good stories behind teams and athletes and realize that sports are more than a game. So today we're back with another Super Bowl recap episode. It's one of our annual episodes, one we always look forward to. We're jam-packed talking about the commercials, halftime show, pregame, the game, basically everything that went down during the Super Bowl on Sunday night. Let's get into it. Starting with Chris Stapleton's national anthem, Miranda told me she has strong feelings about it. So we're going to talk about it. I do. And it's really just like one or two sentences, but I thought it was phenomenal. I love Chris Stapleton. I'm not a huge country fan, but there's like a few select artists that I listen to, one of them being Chris Stapleton. And I was so excited when he was announced to do the national anthem. And I thought he did it beautifully. I thought that it was a very good way to open up the game i think all of the pregame was done really well i also love chris stapleton because he does the country and i think he makes a good argument for a country artist doing the halftime show obviously they're trying to branch out into a different audience in terms of the halftime show but i just want to be appeased one of these times derek and i were saying like what is next for the halftime show because first, I think it's going to be really hard to beat her out. But I also say that every year. I'm like, oh, it's going to be hard to beat this one, hard to beat this one. Mm-hmm. But I feel like they've done like pop, hip hop, and I don't know. I mean, there's so many genres of music, but I feel like it has to be coming one day where it's a country halftime show. I don't know. I guess I just don't see them doing that. I think it would be a group of country artists. I don't think it could just be one country person up there. Unless it's Kelly Clarkson or Carrie Underwood, maybe. Kelly? I don't consider Kelly Clarkson to be country music. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's just me. I guess I think our subconscious wants Kelly Clarkson to do the halftime show. You're right, it does. I mean, that would be the greatest halftime show of literally all time. That's the only thing that would get me hyped for the halftime show. Yeah. Unless they brought the cast High School Musical. Oh my gosh, could you imagine? That, I know, will unfortunately never happen, but that would be a lit halftime show. That would be iconic. Derek and I were looking up, like, best and worst halftime shows, and, like, before Michael Jackson, and I think it was 1993, maybe? Somewhere in the 90s. The halftime show was literally shit. It was, like, very much tailored towards kids, and it was, like, they did, like, an Indiana Jones halftime show, a Disney halftime show, like, just the weirdest shit. It wasn't really like musical acts until oh. Michael Jackson kind of transformed that Super Bowl halftime show. I wonder why they were trying to pertain towards kids. If the Super Bowl's on, the parents are going to watch it. Exactly. So I think that they finally realized it. And then they were like, oh, maybe we shouldn't be having Indiana Jones perform the halftime show because it makes no sense. Well, we did have an Indiana Jones movie trailer. Like the yeah. 27th movie trailer of Indiana Jones. My mom's favorite movies actually are Indiana Jones. But I think it's like the original trio is good. The later one, like they should just stop. But anyway, Chris Stapleton crushed the national anthem. Good job. Good job, buddy. So proud of you. Next, we got Dak Prescott. I missed this part. I was eating. But I missed this. They gave Dak his Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. Elite. Back on the Dak train now for philanthropy reasons. I honestly have always loved Dak Prescott. He was an advocate for mental health and speaking out about his mental health, which you really don't see from male athletes. I've always liked Dak since then. They did a little preview for the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award, why he's winning it, so and so. They also have like pass honorees out there on the field with him, (laughs) what they do every single Super Bowl. The Walter Payton Man of the Year Award is for philanthropy each Team nominates one player, and then a player is voted and wins. And Dak Prescott won this year, and it's a really prestigious honor in the NFL because for the rest of their career, they wear the patch on their jersey, and they're indoctrinated into this group of men who are considered some of the best philanthropists. 
So he's out there and they're presenting it to him. And I will say there were, at least from what I could hear, I felt like there were so many more Eagles fans than Chiefs fans. Like I heard the Eagles fans and I heard them especially booing Dak Prescott because there's no way a Chiefs fan is booing him because who really cares? And I just, again, everything, you don't know when you're in the moment, but I feel like I wouldn't be booing the Walter Payton Man of the Year award, even if it was for a team that I hated, especially when it's a player like Dak Prescott, who's really not known for being a dirty player or hated around the league or anything like that. He seems like a genuinely good guy. And the Eagles fans were just out there booing the crap out of him. I think it's just true Eagles fashion. I think they're the only team that would sit there at the Super Bowl and boo a guy winning a philanthropy award who's not in the game. They have to be the only fan base doing that. And we've said multiple times on this podcast, Eagles and Philadelphia fans are scum. And they proved it yet again. Yeah. Again and again, over and over. And I was sad because I was at my parents' house watching. I was like, I can't believe they're doing that. And my dad reminded me, like, they literally threw eggs at Santa Claus. I get it. You're so passionate for your team and blah, 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 blah. But there's, like, a way to be a respectful sports fan. The man got the Roger Goodell treatment for no reason. Yeah, exactly. Like, Roger Goodell, we all understand why we're booing the man, and he deserves to be booed. But Dak Prescott, I'm sorry, for winning the Walter Payton Man of the Year award, I just don't think I would be booing him. But again, like you said, it's Philly being Philly. I would never boo someone winning that award, but that's just me, a normal human being, I guess. But this is why Cowboys and Giants fans are too. Oh, God, I can't speak for other Cowboys fans and what they would do. But we never go to the Super Bowl anymore, so we'll probably never find out. Through. Never so, know if the Cowboys would be the Walter Payton Man of the Year, so. Who knows? But for now, I can say we definitely won't, and there's nothing to prove that we wouldn't, would or wouldn't at this point, so. True. Let's talk about some commercials. Overall, I'm going to give this a flop again. There's yeah, some please. good one, but I have some bones to pick, mostly with M&Ms. We have been following this M&M saga for weeks now. Basically, the M&Ms decided that the green M&M was not going to wear her go-go boots anymore. And they introduced sneakers to all of the M&Ms. And they have a new purple M&M. She's a female. They had this all-female M&M pack the other month. And so Tucker Carlson decided he was going to get real weird about M&Ms. And he basically put two and two together that the green M&M not wearing her sexy boots anymore meant she was non-binary or a lesbian. So if you wear sneakers, you're a lesbian and are binary. I hate to tell you, but Tucker Carlson said that first. And also, um, that we are labeling sexuality on fucking fictional Eminem characters. Okay? Yeah, I mean, you got a real issue if you are thinking about how hot an Eminem is. It's creepy. So Eminem's decided they were going to troll back. I think was their intention. They were like, the characters are cut. Maya Rudolph is now the spokesperson for M&M's. So people are losing their shit. And Miranda and I eventually came to this conclusion that it was all this big elaborate troll for a Super Bowl commercial, which we were technically right about, but the way they did it was ass. So they had two commercials. The one was Maya Rudolph introducing her new M&M clam bites, which is how... Hopefully everyone else realized that this was not real. Do you see one of the M&Ms in the background holding up a help sign or whatever? And that was it. And then I predicted that she was going to get fired in a commercial and they were just going to bring the characters back. But all the second commercial was, and only half of it aired on my TV. I had to look this up, so I was pissed. It was just a press conference of all the characters being like, we're back. Can't believe they got rid of us for a second. And that was it. That was their whole campaign. It made no sense. They never went back to the original allegations from Tucker Carlson and said, you're a dumbass or like, we're inclusive. They had no message. It was just like, Maya was here for two weeks, did some stupid posts, and then we're back to where we were. Yeah, I just think it was a terrible marketing plan. And like, 
I thought the opportunity initially was genius. And then the execution is very poor. Yeah, the characters are back. Like, there's no. nothing more that they said. So I'm confused as fuck. I feel like it's just, like, a blip in the pan now. Is that the expression? I don't know. But, like, it doesn't matter. They should have just, like, went absolutely balls deep with this troll. Or they should have just ignored it like a normal company and went about their marketing plan. Yeah, exactly. Honestly, like... The commercials overall, I give it a C, C minus. I just feel like the commercials the past few Super Bowls have just been very blah. There were some decent ones, none that I'm going to talk about for two minutes, but the Dunkin' Donuts Ben and J-Lo one was pretty decent. The E-Trade Baby Wedding, those were probably two funnier ones, but a couple heartfelt dog ones too that I liked. I love Bradley Cooper and his mom for T-Mobile. I yes. thought that was hilarious. That was like the only one that I really like laughed out loud. And then it was the Farmer's Dog commercial. Yes. Oh my gosh. I almost started sobbing. That one? Yes. And then also the Amazon dog one. It was so weird because that's exactly what happened with Google. Like he would tear shit up. And then we got another dog. <laughs> basically the story of our dog life those were two of my favorites because yeah. they pertain to our lives i love both of those and i think that they were good marketing because i know the brand because some of the ones that like tried to be funny i didn't even like remember the brand and i was like this is a good marketing the farmer's dog one like i will never forget the first one <laughs> and especially since i just lost my family dog this year too i was like no 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 i can't even look at this for one more second and then the amazon one i just thought it was so cute because it was like oh he thinks he's gonna be created when they leave but actually it's a new friend and he was just bored all along it was so sweet and i'm not surprised and it's that amazon had a good commercial that's the commercial that everyone is talking about mm -hmm. because it tugs at the heartstrings and i think we've seen it year after year but like either you go the funny route or the emotional route and either it pays off or it doesn't and i i love that commercial some of the other ones i wrote down that were like okay like cute i guess so the clueless and racketton one i thought that was cute and i love a good pop culture reference but i already saw that one before the super bowl so i was like um i already saw this will ferrell and the gmc slash netflix it wasn't funny but it was cool i guess is the best word for it like where he goes and pretends to be all the stars and all of the netflix shows i was like wow netflix's budget must be trash if you're having to split an ad with a different company i think we talked about it whenever we talked about them picking up some sports content that their sales were down for like the first time last year or something and that's why they're crafting down on password sharing so I'm not surprised that they had to split a Super Bowl ad with another company. Well, their sales being down are self-inflicted from their password sharing bullshit. So just a thought. Just or a maybe thought. Work on some of your content or maybe don't spread your shows out. And it's like this show comes out in 2022 and then the next season doesn't come out until 2024. Oh, yeah. I had to wait too long to see you season four. Like, Pump them out right now. I just, I don't understand. It's interesting though, because I looked at the Will Ferrell commercial as a Netflix commercial. Like, oh, I, forgot I agree. DMC with. <laughs> no, I agree. The Arvert brand, Mick Ultra. Yes. With the Caddyshack. I thought it was cute. I feel like it could have been like better executed, but I thought it was like a cute idea. I thought the Blue Moon one was good. Yeah. Was better where they had cores and. Miller Light fighting over whose ad it was, and it was like, oh, it's actually a Blue Moon ad. I was like, that's good. Yeah. And then the bu the Bush ad where Sarah McLaughlin's in the tent singing her oh, song with the wolf. I was like, that's so good. That was funny. So I thought they both did a better job than McUltra, but I did like all three. Yeah, I think I like the relevancy of the McUltra and like the throwback to Caddyshack, even though my parents are like, <laughs> there's only one character in this commercial from Caddyshack. And I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of whatever. But having like Serena Williams and Tony Romo and all those people, I thought was funny. We saw a lot of celebrities in commercials. It's oversaturated. It doesn't mean anything anymore, in my opinion. And it was 
so heavy celebrity focus. Like it was mm-hmm. almost every single, I almost said episode, almost every single commercial had a celebrity in it. The Pepsi with Ben Stiller, and I don't even remember the other celebrity who was in it. It might have been Will Ferrell again. I don't know. But like you didn't really need him, I don't think. I think where celebrities work is when it's a throwback to their role, like the girls in Clueless. I thought that was cute. And Bradley Cooper and the Ben Affleck, because you wouldn't see them in that environment. So it's Mm -hmm. the ones where it's like a commercial shoot and there's a celebrity. It's like, okay, this really isn't like special and unique. I don't see how that's moving the needle anymore if everyone's doing it. No, it doesn't really make sense. I think Again, it's cool when you put the celebrities in an environment where we're not really used to seeing them. So like Bradley Cooper being a salesperson with his mom and or trying to do the T-Mobile ad and Ben Affleck surprising people being in the Dunkin' Donuts drive through But when it's just a celebrity, just to throw a celebrity in there, like... Right. Ben Stiller drinking Pepsi makes me want to drink Pepsi less because yeah, I- he's <laughs> gross. And like, what does he have to do? Like, I don't understand what... <laughs> Some other ass commercials, I don't have many on here because most were just like whatever. But the other one that I looked into and read about, do you remember in the first quarter, it was this weird looking like game QR code that came up? Yes. Okay. That was an NFT, which I found out later. It was an NFT. The QR code went to the owner's, like the president or whatever's Twitter account. It didn't actually go to a page where you could buy the NFT. I think it was like a free NFT. I think they're selling for like 700 bucks now. But the QR code went to the owner's Twitter. And I guess he got 100,000 followers from it. But someone was like, you paid $7 million for 100,000 followers? Like, why? Yeah. It was so ass. I thought it was a game. Because I was like, me too. You get it to Derek. And then we were scanning it. And I was like, oh, I think it's just an app. And then you X out of it. Because I was like, I don't want to. I don't I don't know. I thought it was like a phone game. I did too. I was like, why are they advertising Temple Run 2 so bad? I literally thought it was like, a, I don't know, a game where you get a bunch of coins involved or something like that. Right. It, yeah, I thought it was like a, a game. For your phone. Yeah, the only other one I put in here is TurboTax, just because I'm solely tired of seeing their stupid commercials on my TV over and over. They had so many commercials. Like, I think they had the most. No. Timu had the most. What the fuck is that? Out I just don't know. Google. We were trying to Google it, and we could not figure it out. It was like, it's not like a Poshmark where you sell clothes. You're just buying clothes from this app. And Twitter. they're like, I know. They're like, shop like a billionaire, and then the ad's like, four ninety nine wigs. I'm like, what billionaire loves dollar wigs from this ad? They had four commercials. I'm like, that's like yeah. $28 million. For, you're so on. Main commercial. Oh, yeah, it's over and over. I was getting really upset about that. With the girl, like, starting in the dresser and trying on all the different dresses. But, yeah, I was I didn't understand what that app was. My mom was like, is it like a Rakuten? And I was like, I don't, I'm never heard of this app in my life and i don't like i guess if it's an app that's like newer on the market like something you never heard of like i think it is like if you have the money for it fuck it like sure do a super bowl ad but the commercial didn't explain what the app was whatsoever like i did not understand anything that was going on it reminded me of the branch or the website she in yeah where people buy all of their cheap ass clothes from China, which you should not be supporting that whatsoever. And then they buy it and it's the thinnest fabric and it breaks in like a second. That's what that commercial reminded me of. I was like, very similar vibes. And then there's like, but if you look at something where it is like more luxury items that are being re- resold, which is like the real real is one of those websites. And their commercials are very clean professional they show the luxury items they show the brands that they carry i didn't understand anything that was going on in that what to call tiamo i don't know a (laughs) timu i didn't understand that i know i saw it four times i don't i don't know the name of this is orange ass annoying commercial is all i remember there was a couple of repeat commercials because there was something else that played twice, too. So what is the point of that? Because you already paid $7 million for one Super Bowl ad. Then you're going to play another $7 million for the same Super Bowl ad? 
yeah, no, it's not gonna, it doesn't work. No, I didn't get that. I just think that the brands that we always loved and looked forward to, the commercials like a Doritos, just have not been to the caliber that they once were. And we were even talking about the Bud Light commercial, the Budweiser Clydesdales. I, yeah, they weren't Where, there. What happened? I don't know who's in charge of making these decisions, but overall as a collective, it's like the whole industry decided we need these to suck ass. Yeah. When you're spending $7 million for an ad, I would want it to be like the best ad ever. Bring it, bro. Come on. Let's go. Some creativity yeah. would be sick. And I just feel like back in the day, there used to be so many memorable ones. And honestly, if it, I didn't write down half of these, I would have forgotten them. There was just too many confusing moments in the commercials, and I don't want to have to think about it. It needs to be very straightforward. So a lot of confusion, a lot of celebrities, a lot of QR codes. We need more dogs and creativity. Let's move on to the halftime show. I'll go. Obviously, they lip sing. Yeah. You need to make it seem like you're not doing that. There was at least eight points in this performance where I'm like, please pretend to sing your song that's on. That's She's just not. And I feel bad dealing this way now because I know she's pregnant. But I was like, she barely moved. She barely sung. And I don't know. I just, like, we know the performer she is. I was underwhelmed with how she performed, not by the songs, because obviously she has great songs, but they're just playing over the speaker. So that's how I felt. Yeah, I mean, I loved it. And I genuinely think that only Rihanna fans enjoyed it. Looks like society it's split like 50 50 on if it was a good performance or not there's a difference i guess between lip singing and singing over a track do i know it no but apparently she was singing over a track and i'm like okay well i don't know and i guess most artists do i that was a little disappointing but i understood why she wasn't moving a lot because she is significantly pregnant and as soon as she unzipped her coat i was like oh my god she's pregnant because she touched her belly and i know there was like that's what i was trying to figure out at first and the whole internet was like is she pregnant is she not because mm-hmm. you also don't want to call a woman pregnant if she's not pregnant it's just her postpartum belly because she had a baby i think her baby turned one in may I or maybe I already turned one. I could be getting my facts wrong. But I was just like so shook. And I immediately was like, oh, she's pregnant. So I was like, she's not going to be moving a bunch. Right. Because I couldn't fucking even do that. Not. I know. As soon as I figured out, I was like, fuck, I feel so bad. But yeah, I mean, I feel like a lot of people were trying to figure out like, is she, is she not? But I loved the stage setup. Like I thought yes. that was- super cool and different i was not expecting her to come out to bitch better have my money because my family and i we did the whole worksheet and we all put in 10 bucks and whoever got the most right won the pot Mm -hmm. Uh, and one of the questions was what song is she going to come out to and it had some choices and then other and i genuinely thought she was coming out to run this town because that makes the most sense that would hype everybody up And Bitch Better Had My Money started, and I was like, what? I loved all of the songs that she selected to play, though. I think she did a great job, and I know she was stressing about it because she literally changed her set list, like, 35 times or something like that. But I thought she did a great job overall. I think she is a genius marketer because whenever she was walking down and she got the makeup and touched up her face, that's her makeup brand. Oh, I was like, why'd she do that? I get it now. And they've already seen an 800% increase in traffic on their website and sales. Like, wow. And so smart. But I think that the halftime show has gotten out of him. It's gotten so hyped up where you need all these gets. You need to be doing like a whole thing for an artist like Rihanna who has the discography. She doesn't need a bunch of guests. Like, would it have been cool? Of course, it's always cool. But she can stand on her own and she proved it. And I think that she just really wanted to go out there and put on a show for her fans. And that's what she did. I don't think she put on a show for like the casual Rihanna fan or just a football fan who doesn't give a shit about honor or music or the halftime show. But I thought she did an amazing job and major props to her. I also saw on TikTok kind of explaining it, like the artistry behind it. And I don't know if it's true, but it totally makes sense to me that like the white 
things were sperm and she's in red so she's the egg and like the way that her set list goes it's like a cycle of love essentially so like it starts out like bitch better have my money like i hate you like give me my money whatever goes through kind of that goes through getting back together goes through a breakup again then goes through like finding someone you actually love and care about and then that's why she ends with shine bright like a diamond so i think that makes complete sense and i was like okay like love it even more but yeah and i think it's a hard to like compare knowing what's that's like performing at the halftime show period but doing it while you're pregnant I would never notice things like that. Just like, oh, she's performing. But that makes a lot of sense how you say it. Maybe I need like a manual for these (laughs) halftime shows to be able to appreciate them. Because I feel like I never do. Like, I feel like every year I'm like, oh, okay. But And I'm sure they set the halftime show performance probably almost a year ahead of the Super Bowl. Right. She was not like anticipating being pregnant. Or maybe she was, I don't know. But I give her major props for not just being like, sorry, I can't do this. And I just think it was cute because a lot of the interviews during the week of the Super Bowl with her asked her like, oh, are you going to bring in a guest on? Because obviously that's always a question. And she's like, yeah, like I might have a prize guest. And like she was talking about her baby. So I thought that was cute. And I think that, again, Rihanna... There's a reason she hasn't performed or put out music in seven years. She is a successful businesswoman. She has her Fenty makeup, beauty, clothing. Like, she does not need to put out music. She does not need to do the halftime show. Nobody ever gets paid to do the halftime show. And I think she genuinely just went out there to perform and do it for her fans. I don't give a shit about what any of the critics are saying. And I feel like some people are going so hard for her and it's just like she doesn't care about you joe schmo on fucking instagram that is weird to care that much about something i think we went into it because we didn't know rihanna was like pregnant like expecting like a full-blown dance performance and all yes. this stuff which i totally understand but i think people were pissed because she just stood there and kind of sang her songs And they're like, oh, my God, like, this is not a halftime show. This is so boring. I had a great time. I feel bad. Who did the halftime show a few years ago? The two women that danced a lot. Lopez and Shakira. Yeah, I think that was more what I was expecting and what other people were expecting, just based on previous halftime shows, for sure. The halftime shows have been good, like, the last few years. I don't think there's been a halftime show where I'm like, oh, this is awful. I can't even remember the last person. Maybe like a Maroon 5. Stop. So think about boring and irrelevant. And people tuned in more for the halftime show than the football game. Like this was the most hyped halftime show ever. It and was. She honestly is a smart business woman because like they did all of the marketing that went behind it like when she announced and then before the Super Bowl, she put out a clothing line, Fenty, with the NFL. She really did a great job of showcasing that she was going to be a part of the Super Bowl. And I think it was good for the NFL. And I think it was good overall for the Super Bowl, which is why they booked the halftime show, is to bring in a different audience. And I think that there was a significant increase in people watching the halftime show than the actual game itself. Probably. Kelly Clarkson next, please. She just (laughs) did the awards. It's time. It's time. I just am so interested who's going to be next. It should be her. I agree. And I think similar to Rihanna, like she has the discography to be able to just go out there and do it. I agree. She did whatever she wants. I will not criticize it. I would just be shocked if they do like pop back to back. Because I feel like they always try to, like, switch it up. Like, I couldn't see, like, a Bad Bunny for the halftime show next year. I don't know who that is. Honestly, pop, hip-hop, and raps me are all the same. If it's not country, like, it's the other ones. It's country or, or it's not country is how I look at music. Anyway, that probably sparks you. Let's move on to the game. My brain can't even think about the game. Just, this game, I wish I was watching two different teams play this game. 
because we don't like them. Yeah, da da. But it's really like a game. It was probably one of the best Super Bowl games we've watched in a really, really, really long time because they can be boring. Unfortunately, I think the talk of this game is the holding penalty that happened. Yeah. So the last drive of the game, the Chiefs are in the red zone, and there's a play where James Bradbury gets called for holding on Juju Smith-Schuster. Is it a holding? Yes. And James Bradbury said, yes, I held. Is it a weak holding penalty? Absolutely. There had been no holding calls. There had been no pass interference calls the whole game. The only flags that were thrown were for offsides, neutral zone infractions, that kind of thing. They were letting the DBs play. As much as I love that the Eagles lost, I think that this call is a problem and only exemplifies the fact that the refs have been so garbage in the playoffs and trolling the outcome of games with calls. That's my thought. I agree. And my family always makes fun of me because I'm like, it's scripted, it's scripted. Mostly just to mess with them. But I think that's why people genuinely believe it a and why it's becoming like a bigger and larger and larger conversation is because of the refs and i think that that holding penalty happened because they call that fucking dallas goddard catch a catch when that was so evidently not a catch and i feel like we see it all the time refs fuck up and then they try to make up for it with the other team and that's exactly what happened because sometimes there's plays and they replay it over and over again and i'm like i don't know is that a catch is it not like it's so hard to tell i don't know how they're gonna make this and that catch was not a catch he did not have full control of the ball and then put two feet inside of the field he won out Mm -hmm. of bounds and they called it a catch things should be when you're Calling penalties and all this stuff, they need to be even across the board, across the team, across the league, across the season, all season long, including the Super Bowl. I guarantee if that was in another game, they wouldn't have called it a catch. I agree with you. This is an obvious call when you're looking at it at instant replay. I understand why initially you're calling this a catch, but when you look at the replay, the ball pops out of his hands. It's in the air. Like, he literally does not have control of this ball. And by that point, his left foot comes up. And by the time he gets the ball back, he's only got one foot down. And he goes out of bounds. That's an obvious no catch. We're looking at it for three minutes straight. Everyone in the world sees it. If you this is a catch, you're fucking crazy. Because you know it's not. Unless you're running for the Eagles. But the game's over. Let's be realistic and and normal about the situation. That's not a catch. And those are reasons why people think it's scripted. Because in what world are you calling this a catch after looking at it in New York over and over and over again? And why are you doing that? So, yeah, I agree. That call is bullshit. It leads to a touchdown. And then... The other call is the folding call, which if you're not calling that for the rest of the 60 minutes, then why are you calling this right now? Under two minutes left in the game. That's a call that decides the outcome of this game. And they only had the two bad calls, but they're two very, very important calls that put us where we're at now. It's just getting ridiculous. Like, it's exhausting at this point. I don't know if the NFL sees it yet, but they have, like, a serious problem. And this is a, this is not a new thing. Like, this has been going on for years. And I think it's just becoming more blatantly obvious. I don't know why. Maybe, like, fans are more educated or maybe social media influence, like, seeing a play on social media, too, or having explanations for it. And I'm sure, like, the Eagles players and the Eagles fans feel this. And I know if it was my team out there and that happened to me, I would be so fucking mad. It's frustrating when... You put the best team on the field and you're putting your fate in these refs who are just not up to par. I think when it's a game like the Super Bowl, there shouldn't be calls like that Dallas Goddard catch and that holding with under two minutes left. And again, if they were calling holding the whole game, that's different. But the fact, like you said, that they're doing it for the first time and with under two minutes left in the game not a a very similar situation to what happened at the end of last year's game too that we talked about yeah 
And it's just painful because I I totally understand how those fans and players feel because like that that's what did it like that one thing that is not even in our control like lost us the game. If I'm an Eagles fan, I'm losing my mind over that call. It's just another chapter of the saga of what is the NFL doing. And I sent that article the other day, Roger and I was like. I think this had been the best officiated playoffs ever. I'm like, that's a sus thing to say. There are like certain scenarios where you can clearly tell that the refs are going for one team. And <laughs> like, I don't know. Maybe like it's a conspiracy theory and whatever, but I don't know. If it's like multiple times in a game, and I'm not talking about the Super Bowl, I'm talking about the playoffs as a whole. Weird. Even the last week where games were having playoff implications, it was happening that there's so many situations that you can go through from week 18 up to this point and be like, that is so suspect. And it just happened too many times and in too many games for it to be a coincidence any longer. Just my opinion. So again, and it's just unfortunate that this was one of the best Super Bowls. And I think yeah. it will go down as one of the best, most entertaining Super Bowls of all time. I absolutely loved that it wasn't a blowout, which I didn't think it was. I knew mm-hmm. the offenses were just going to go back and forth. Like, I knew that's what was going to happen. I loved that it was just, like, pure entertainment, and it made up for the rest of the Super Bowl because the fucking commercials sucked ass. And it's always hard when the commercials are awful and the game is awful. Because you want to see a good football game, and as a fan, you want it to be a good football game so, like, other people coming into the circle and they're like oh this Mm -hmm. is actually fun exciting and i thought that each team played phenomenally i'm obviously super stoked that the chiefs won because i a giants fan i'm not gonna root for the eagles this is not how it works and i would expect the same thing when we're eventually in the super bowl and i'm fucking 60 years old probably there were so many good moments and so many good parts of this game that it sucks that i just everyone's talking about that holding penalty well i think you miss out on a potential really good ending to this game because of it and it seems a little lackluster the way it ends despite it being whatever 37 to 34 the chiefs go down with two minutes left there's a holding call they kick the game winning field goal blah blah blah. jalen hurts in this offense doesn't get a chance to at least tie the game and send this overtime so despite it being very high scoring, the ending is blah. And then people think, oh, well, maybe it wasn't as good of a game as we thought. It doesn't have that photo finish ending because the ending is this holding call. I genuinely, before that holding call, I was like, oh, they're going to overtime. They're going to score here and then the Eagles are going to score. We're getting an overtime Super Bowl, which would right. have been cool. But no, instead, holding call happens, and then they just run the clock out until they hit the field goal. I'm glad they won. The Eagles are my least favorite team in the NFL, and I know I seem sad at the ending, and I am because it's horrible for the sport, for the game to end that way, even though it worked out in our favor. As much as we shit talk Eagles fans and Philadelphia and all that, I feel for them. Because that is something that lives with you forever as a fan. I would be a wreck. Yeah, like I would need this whole week off. Like, don't even fucking talk. <laughs> and I think that the positive side, though, and I like commented this on one of our reels the other day, is the Eagles aren't going anywhere. That team is not leaving. I think they proved that even though it was the first time that that group of people went to the Super Bowl with their coach and all that, they performed phenomenally. Jalen Hurts, like. Ugh. I wish you weren't on the Eagles. <laughs> Same. He's such a good quarterback. I think he competed beautifully against Patrick Mahomes, and I genuinely think the Eagles are going to be a pain in our Cowboy and Giants asses for the next decade. I will probably see the Super Bowl matchup multiple times again, because why not? I texted Kelsey like after the Super Bowl, and I was like, yeah, I go Chiefs, so happy they won. And then I was like, and now I never need to see them win another Super Bowl. Just because I'm not a dynasty person, unless it's my own team, obviously, but that has never fucking happened, which is why I'm not a dynasty person. <laughs> I'm more of an underdog, really. I always love rooting for the underdog. I like when it's like different teams in the Super Bowl. I like when a different team wins. Not just the Super Bowl, like any sports championship. I think it makes it more exciting. You get new faces, new players, new stories. 
I am not a girl who likes to see the same team win over and over and over again. But I love the storylines. I watch a lot of like pregame content, which I always love on Super Bowl Sunday. I love seeing Mm -hmm. all like the different stories and whatever. The Kelsey Bowl was exciting. Yes. Happy for them. Happy for Mama Kelsey. Was very sad to not see her do the coin toss, but it's okay. Honestly, a miss by the NFL for sure. Seriously. But I know on their podcast new heights like because jason kelsey has been through retirement and basically like every guest they have on travis is like what do you think and they're like no no you can't retire (laughs) just so they can have another kelsey ball which i feel like could definitely happen i did think and kelsey and i kind of talked about this it was interesting that travis was like no one believed in us no one called that we were going to be in the Super Bowl or win. Chiefs weren't in anyone's mouth and look at us, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what? I was so confused. Is this the Jacksonville Jaguars or something? Like, yeah. what is this comment? You're the best team in the NFL. We've all known it. They heard a lot of garbage about Cincinnati and how Joe Burrow owns Patrick Mahomes. But there's not a single person who sat here and thought at the beginning of the season that the Chiefs aren't going to be in the Super Bowl. And I think that a lot of the pregame announcers picked the Eagles. My father-in-law was saying that the whole Fox crew, like Michael Strahan, Terry Bright, like every single one chose the Eagles. I didn't see it, but that's Mm -hmm. crazy to me as well. So maybe that's what he was referring to. But I was like, bro, you are the best tight end in the league. Your offense is amazing. I don't think anyone was like, Thinking you were the underdog, <laughs> but still love and adore him. Him and Jason's podcast, and I only listen on Twitter to the clips, but unbelievable. I love listening to the two of them together. They're impossible to hate, even yeah. despite his weird outbursts at the Super Bowl about them being underdogs. I'm happy for him. It was just super exciting to see the first brothers in the Super Bowl. This was a history making Super Bowl because it also yep. was the first time two black quarterbacks have played each other in the Super Bowl, which I love that they had Doug Williams there. Yeah. It's him. He totally deserves it. And he broke down barriers for them to be there. I think it was also the first time that a female sports agent was representing one of the starting quarterbacks, Jalen Hurd. So it was just a very cool and exciting and history-making Super Bowl. So I think there were so many positives that came out of it. Yeah. I'll be interested to see what happens next year. I will predict a rematch for next year's Super Bowl because I don't think anyone can touch the Eagles. I'm predicting that one of these teams will make it back to the Super Bowl next year. Great prediction. Very vague. (laughs) Not good at predictions, but I do think we'll see a repeat team. And then I think, like, we will see a repeat of this matchup. Will it be next year? I hope not. I don't know. I hope not either, because like we said, can never root for the Eagles. And I'm just tired of rooting for the Chiefs or like a team that I really don't want to win. Story of our lives. Why can't we get like a Jaguars and Lions Super Bowl? <laughs> Someone that we really don't care about, but like on the flip side, we will be genuinely happy for either team. Oh, that would be the best vibes ever. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Next week, we'll be back with an interview with Kansas City Chiefs fan about their Super Bowl win. As always, check out our link tree, which you can find in the description of this episode. This is our one-stop shop for you to find all of our social media accounts. And then if you want to share your fandom story like the Kansas City Chiefs fan, you can sign up on Linktree as well. And so you don't miss any of the upcoming pods, subscribe to us on whatever you're listening on. Spotify, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Amazon, and more. Thank you again, and we'll see you next Wednesday.